drawing on art history, film and literature. The photographs of Gregory Crudson and Anna Gaskell offer too many or too few clues of what's going on, exacerbating a sense of incoherence. They also emphasise their story's incompleteness by virtue of being still, stop-action images. It is left up to the viewer to attempt to complete the story, to imagine what happened before and after each frame. Like Sherman, Crudson uses pastiche, drawing on various genres and evoking Hollywood tropes to tell unsettling fictional tales of contemporary life. The freeze-frame stillness of dramatic moments in his photographs recalls the history painting tradition. We can't tell if these are dreams, fantasies or apparitions, but they are so detailed that they become convincing photographic records of impossible events. So what's the story here? How do you know? What are the clues? And does it remind you of anything? The photograph is actually, in part, a reconstruction from the film Psycho. Crudson used this as a starting point, drawing on a shared connection to that imagery, with a certain kind of dread, magnified by the fact that a picture can never resolve itself in the way that a film can. According to Crudson, for all the talk of my pictures being narratives or that they're about storytelling, there's really very little actually happening in the pictures. Since the photograph is frozen and mute, since there is no before and after, I don't want there to be a conscious awareness of any kind of literal narrative. And that's why I really try not to pump up plot. I want to privilege the moment. That way, the viewer is more likely to project their own narrative onto the picture. What the viewer brings to it is almost more important than what I bring to it. I'm very moved by the fact that people are drawn into the pictures and that they do bring their own history and their own interpretation to the photograph. In Anna Gaskell's style of narrative photography, the image is carefully planned and staged. The scene presented is artificial in that it exists only to be photographed. While this is similar to the process of filmmaking, there is an important difference. Gaskell's photographs are not tied together by a linear thread. It is as though their events all take place simultaneously in an ever-present. Each image's before and after are lost, allowing possible interpretations to multiply. In her Wonder series, the worlds of fantasy and reality collide around the figure of Alice, the well-known heroine of Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. For the artist, Wonderland is a place where anything can happen and the boundaries of real space and time do not apply. While the ultimate fate of Gaskell's Alice is ambiguous in this magical and dangerous world, we are left with a wonderfully unsettling view into an alternate reality in which logic collapses and nothing is as it seems. Unlike photographers, postmodern storytellers who use video and film have the narrative devices of time and continuity to play with allowing them to use other strategies to fracture and fragment the narratives. Like photographers who use pastiche, video artists often start with one or more particular genre, for example the horror movie or the western, then shuffle the genre's codes in ways that undermine the expectations of the viewers. One master of this approach is Isaac Julian, who creates disjointed, dreamlike film narratives that reference familiar Hollywood movies and genres. But rather than provide the kind of clear narrative lines such as in popular film, Julian's stories are open-ended and ambiguous, allowing for multiple interpretations. For example, his 1999 film, The Long Road to Mazatlan, mixes familiar images in the Wild West, the cowboy, the cattle yard, the dirt road, with more contemporary and homoerotic iconography. By doing so, it subverts the Western sexual codes and clear distinctions between goodies and baddies. The film centres on a pair of cowboys, one dressed in black, the other in white, who become involved in a dance of desire against a backdrop of desert landscapes. The work makes reference to Tennessee Williams, Warhol's film Lonesome Cowboys, 
Scorsese's Taxi Driver, Are You Talking to Me, and the work of David Hockney. Here's another familiar scene. So what do you think's happened to this character? And what do you expect to happen next? And then what? What will eventually happen, do you think? Rodney Graham creates short, looped videos that, like Julian, draw on then undermine the conventions of film narrative. In these circular featurettes, as he calls them, very little happens, and then the end of the story blends into the beginning. Vexation Island draws on the novel Robinson Crusoe, the original shipwreck narrative. A fantasy as escape from civilization. The genre lives on in contemporary forms like Tom Hanks' film Castaway and the reality TV series Survivor. Graham's nine minute long version presents a figure lying on the beach, presumably shipwrecked. He wakes up and a noisy parrot directs his attention to a coconut tree above. The man shakes the tree, causing the coconut to drop on his head and then for him to pass out and return to the state in which we originally found him. So how is this different to other shipwreck tales like Robinson Crusoe and Castaway? Well, Graham's version of the shipwreck story suggests not triumph over self and outside obstacles, but the futility of imagining escape. Pierre Huig also draws inspiration from films. In The Third Memory, the story of a Brooklyn bank robbery gone wrong is told three times, from archival television footage of the actual event, from a fictionalized film recreation starring Al Pacino, and thirdly, as it was recounted almost 30 years after the fact by one of the protagonists. Because the bank robbers took hostages and engaged in an eight-hour standoff with police, the actual event was broadcast live on national television. The film version was A Dog Day Afternoon, the highly acclaimed 1975 film by Sidney Lumet. The third version was a reenactment from The Surviving Robber on a set based on the fictional movie set. So, do you think the third version, the reenactment, was closer to the original event as broadcast on national television or to the fictionalised Al Pacino film. Pierre Huig discussing the relationship between fact and fiction. Uh, so, so, so now you have a guy which is in jail and, and, and someone come and say, hey, look, you have a film about you and then you see Al Pacino and you see his life. You see, not, I mean, this hard moment of his life played by someone else, right? Uh, um, so I invite this guy, the, the actual robber, uh, the bank robber, and I reset the fictional bank in Paris, and um, he's actually doing a reconstitution of what happened. In a certain way, he's narrating what happened, but by narrating, he's also acting, right? I, I give him a set twice like that. And he's in the center, and he have different different people, and it's him who say, "You are the bank manager. You go there. Me, I was there. I enter. It's like a police reconstitution." What is interesting here is, is the same thing: is that you have someone who is unable today to know the difference between the real event that happened and the fictional, the, the fictional situation he was he confront, right? Which is the film. So when now he's actually um, try to memor to re to memor rememorize <laughs> the event or the situation, he's unable. He's mixing the fiction and the fact. Even more it's, it's even more uh, surprising. It's even more surprising that actually before he robbed the bank, he just went to see the Godfather, <laughs> and take some, some, some lines and he goes, oh, that's cool, you know. I'm, to, I'm just going to say that when I'm going to rob the band. So he's really sandwiched between two fiction. Speaking of blurring the line between fiction and reality, is anyone familiar with Hilda Crone Hughes' work Hanging in the Woods 
or, as the Daily Mail puts it, Naked Artist Stuck Up a Tree for Three Hours Wins Award. According to the artist, I think people feel for the subject. The emotions are raw. The boundary between the fiction and reality breaks down. When you watch, the audience watch it. Some people think it's funny, and then they see the distress is real, so it becomes less funny. But I don't mind people laughing. As soon as I make a work, it is for the audience. Half is my intention, and half is what the audience get from it. It has gone around the world. It's a weird experience to see something that I intended to be fictional turn real, and then be in the news and turn fictional again through the media. Like Pierre Huig, Catherine Sullivan also presents multiple versions of the same narrative, drawing inspiration from films. For example, in Gold Standard, Hysteric, Melancholic, Degraded, Refined, she reworks a pivotal scene in Arthur Penn's 1962 film, The Miracle Worker, in which Annie Sullivan tries to teach Helen Keller how to eat by herself. The scene is presented in multiple versions side by side, each time with different actors whose race, age and even gender vary. With such drastic changes of identity and mood, the meaning of the scene constantly shifts, so that at one point it may seem a model of enlightened instruction, and at another an exercise in sadism.